Hey everyone, Brendan Snyder here. How are you? Thanks so much for joining me and welcome to another episode of New Music Finds where I like to collect together all the stuff that I've purchased over the past week, present it to you guys, give you a little bit of background. I get it from different places like my local record store, of course, but also online retail like Amazon, eBay, and more. So this particular week, I've got 18 different things to run through with you, six of which are new releases, and I got a bunch of other catalog stock type stuff. We'll get into that here in just a bit, but before we do, if you're new to my channel and haven't already hit the subscribe button, please do. Also, leave a comment, hit like. All those things do help support my channel. I'd greatly appreciate it. And of course, as an added bonus, by turning on notifications, you're going to stay up to date on everything going on in the world of music, just like this with New Music Finds. So let's dive right in with new releases here. First one up was a major one for me at least. I did do a full review on this and we'll leave a link in the description. I'm talking about the brand new Blue Oyster Cult Ghost Stories. So this is their 15th and final studio album. Although it is a compilation because it's made up of songs that were originally recorded from 1978 to 1983. So it features um, both past and present members on it. Uh, we do have one song from 2016. It's the last track on here called If I Fell, which is cover of the Beatles song. And so the album for me at least is a little bit disjointed in that because uh, being recorded at different time over a five-year period back during their heyday, plus throwing in something from 2016, and then uh, Richie Castellano, uh, one of the newest members who plays guitar and uh, also sings with them, uh, went in and embellished the tracks, adding additional guitar, keyboards, vocals, things like that. And all in all, stuff sounds really good. It was recorded at different times, uh, live, rehearsal, and demos, but none of the stuff on here sounds live. It sounds all studios. They must have stripped away any uh, you know live audience sounds or anything of that nature in order to get a good studio mix on it. But um, it's not like they went into the studio and professionally recorded all of the songs. So sometimes the vocals are a little mixed uh, more in the background, you know, than perhaps I would like. And sometimes stuff is, uh, you know, mixed really well and other times maybe not so much. So nothing against Richie Castellano who said he demixed everything to remix it. I'm sure he had limitations as far as what he could do with those older recordings from 78 to 83. But all in all, not an entirely brand new album, but new to us because we haven't heard this stuff and kind of a cool way to cap the career with a uh, you know, full circle, bringing it all the way back to the classic era. But all in all, cool album to have. Don't think it's going to be replacing any of their uh, you know main albums, but it is, as I said, a cool sort of uh, curio that I think fans should check out. Uh, next up, Mark Knopfler, uh, One Deep River, very good album. This one sort of surprised me. I wasn't expecting a lot from it. I haven't been into his last few solo albums all that much. I think it's been about maybe six years or so since we've had an album from him. But uh, this one here, I really have enjoyed it. And maybe that's because of the recent CD single that he released. Well, it's just single. I bought a CD of it. But the recent single that he released for um, Local Hero, where he brought in 60 different guest performers to be on it. And that one really blew me away. That song is not on this album here, but all in all, it did sort of whet my appetite for getting some Mark Knopfler and having to only wait like another month to get it. Um, you know, I'm still sort of riding high on that. But I got to say, I'm enjoying this album. So it was uh, good for me. Next up. Orchestral. So um, this is run by Alan Davy, a former bassist for Hawkwind. Um, and it definitely is the sort of space rock stuff, but it's got more orchestration. I think that's why they use the term orchestral with this. But the cool thing is they've got a lot of other outside musicians. Um, or what am I say? They do have outside musicians. They have a lot of former Hawkwind people joining in. So we get Nick Turner, Bob Calvert, Simon Howes. Um, Hugh uh, Langdon and Mick Slattery in here. And then we get uh, other cool people. Mick Taylor, uh, former Rolling Stone guitar player, Carmine Apice, Jeff Downs, Helios Creed, uh, Danny Faulkner, Ginger Baker, Adam Hamilton. So a lot of cool people on this. Remake of the song Silver Machine with uh, William Shatner singing. 
All right. These are a couple cool ones that I had found uh, only just putting together the What Just Dropped episode. The guys saw me post on Saturday. I do these, you know, new episodes every uh, post every Saturday, but I put together all the new stuff that dropped. And, and even when I put these together, I find a lot of things. So this is one I didn't know anything about, group called Holler. But just look at that album cover. It screams 1980. So I had to check it out. And boy, am I glad that I did because this stuff here turned out to be right up my alley. It's a cool throwback to the 80s. Uh, the name of the band, uh, or sorry, namesake, that leads to the band name is Terrence Holler from Eldridge, which is a prog rock group, uh, progressive metal, I think. But um, this here is full on 80s keyboard style stuff in the vein of like Journey and Toto, you know, meets Bon Jovi. So it's got some of that 80s glam metal sound to it, but with more melodic rock leanings. And uh, there's uh, Terrence uh, Holler there. But I thought it was pretty darn good. If you guys are into, you know, 80s uh, melodic rock, uh, if you like 80s glam, that kind of stuff, check this out. Holler, it's really good. And this next one, even more so if you're into, again, the 80s melodic rock, but glam metal sound, King Zebra. So while this album cover doesn't really scream it the way that this one does here, I actually found that this one here uh, even better, uh, in my opinion. Um, so King uh, Zebra... They're a Swiss band, I think. Um, let's see, is there a photo? There's a photo of them in here somewhere, I know. Um, and I don't know much about any of the guys that are in here. They had all the names, um, and I don't know if they come from anywhere. But the music just sounds really good. I think the lead vocalist has been kicking around for a good 30 years or so, whereas some of the other guys are newer members because they talk about sort of the old and new coming together in this. But man... This album here really, really blew me away. King Zebra, I keep popping this one on, so definitely check that out. And here's an album that's been getting pushed back for a solid four months, finally came out. Um, it's a reissue. It's from the Grassroots, and it's a collection of three other albums on the BGO Records label. Uh, in fact, I think this is the last three albums that I didn't have by them. I've had greatest hits, and I've got uh, had this one on LP, and I had a Japanese edition of this, but I didn't have this one here. Uh, it's good to get them all together. And so what's cool about this one is, is disc one in here has Leaving It All Behind and Move Along, the first two of these here. Disc two has a lot of mileage, sorry, a lot of mileage is on this, but taking the place of what would have been an entire other disc, because there's only three albums on here, is just bonus tracks. And you've got uh, 13 added bonus tracks on this thing. So very cool to get this. I was just expecting to get the three albums. And when I found out there was all that bonus material, made me like this even more. And boy, does this stuff sound good. Um, I've always been, well, not always, ever since I found the band, which was back during the pandemic, I found the Grassroots, they're a late 60s uh, band that continued into the 70s and went from sort of more pop stuff to soulful, sort of rock R&B flavored music. Um, but they sound really, really good on these three albums here, so I've been enjoying it. All right, um, so last week's stuff, when I went to uh, High Fidelity Records, one of the things I found was this cool Mark Bonilla sampler. It had five tracks on it. I really enjoyed this, and it found out, oh, hey, it actually comes from a full-length album. So I ordered this off of eBay, American uh, Matador is the title of this here. What's interesting is that um, the sampler has Whiter Shade of Pale, uh, the Purple Harem song. It's an instrumental. And then I get this, and the Whiter Shade of Pale that is on here has vocals. But the vocals are by Glenn Hughes, so that was a really cool thing. Um, making this nice to have an instrumental version, but I kind of wish the instrumental version had been on here. Uh, you know, and maybe the vocal version uh, was at the end of the album or something, I don't know. But this has uh, two vocal tracks and all, everything else on it is instrumental. So Whiter Shade of Pale is sung by Glenn Hughes. And then Wake the Baby is actually sung by Mark Bonello, who has a fantastic voice. So don't know why, one, he didn't sing Whiter Shade of Pale, but also, why isn't he singing on other things, man? So this is really good. If you like some good um, shred guitar, but not like metal shredding, just really good guitar playing stuff, 
This is a fantastic album. I knew him from the Keith Emerson band. So he's the guitar player as part of this, you know, Keith Emerson, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. And I always wanted him to have done other stuff, but I've had a hard time finding anything. And I, I don't know, I guess I just missed this, or maybe it was hard to locate initially. So after finding the sampler, which kind of was like, whoa, fantastic, finally some Mark, um, you know, uh, sorry, <laughs> Vanilla. Um, and I just quickly looked up on eBay and found this and it was no problem. So definitely glad to get a hold of that. Um, I also picked up the Wallflowers album, um, Bringing Down the Horse. Uh, just that had to do with the passing of Michael Ward, their guitar player. And I'd had that album back in the day, but I got rid of it a long time ago. I don't really know why. And I bought it, just, you know, was feeling it, wanted to revisit it kind of a thing. And it just clicked, it just hit the right spot. So I wanted to add some more. So I bought Breach, the follow-up album. And uh, glad to get a hold of this guy here. And I've got a little bit more of their stuff on the way, uh, which you guys will see next Wednesday when I post, uh, including their latest album, but definitely enjoying it, getting more into that. And uh, a couple weeks back, I had picked up some Uriah Heap and I got Salisbury uh, to add into the collection. Some of their earlier stuff, um, I was missing, I picked up The Magician's Birthday, and I picked up the debut, uh, very heavy, very humble um, albums. And then last week I'd picked up a best of from that early era. But all in all, just really enjoying that. I had always been a fan much more of the later era stuff. I got into the band in 1999 with Sonic Origami, and I went back into the 80s, but I never went too far back beyond that. I picked up a few of their albums, but I was always into them or knew them more as to what they had become as opposed to the more keyboard-laden style stuff that was early on. And I don't know why I never really clicked with me, but now listening to it, I feel like I sort of found a new deep purple and I'm having fun really digging into this stuff and uh, listening to it. All right, um, I also made a recent trip, of course, to Sound Exchange, as I do just about every week, but you guys see the videos. I, I basically go at least every two weeks. Um, if you pay attention to how often I post the videos with Anthony, what I call the Sound Exchange sessions where we do discussion topics, it's every other week. That's because Anthony works every other Saturday. So I'm, I'm always there at least every other week for that uh, to film. And then while I'm there, um, I usually buy stuff. And then of course, sometimes I just can't wait and I go in between all of that. But um, if you saw me do the uh, guest spot on Sea of Tranquility with Pete Pardo, and thank you, Pete, for asking me to join that. I had a really good time doing it. We discussed different um, you know, bands and whether they fall into progressive rock or art rock or pop or what. So we talked about like ELO, 10CC. Uh, one of the bands in there was Super Tramp. And before I had filmed that video, I was at Sound Exchange and I came across this Super Tramp Best of Volume 2. I've got the Best of Volume 1, so I had to pick this up. And I always like the Volume 2 Best of's better because usually all the hits are on the Volume 1. So then these are like deep cuts off of the album, at least for me. I mean, they may well have been singles at the time, but they're not the ones that are like the big well-known stuff. So it's like getting a whole album worth of deep cuts. So I picked that up, but I also picked up Roger Hodgins, I think second solo album. This is from 1987, Hi Hi. Um, I've got his first one, which is really good. And I know I had debated on buying this a bit in the past because I've gone through different phases of being in and not out, but just really into Super Tramp or not so much kind of a thing. And it really depends on the mood and I've got to be in that mood for that more progressive rock yet pop mood because I always kind of consider them pop and that's one of the things we sort of came to the conclusion of we started calling it prog adjacent um, or, or progressive pop uh, because there really wasn't a category down the middle for these bands to being prog they were in all these other uh, cursory areas of stuff but um, you know when I'm in the mood for that stuff it really hits the right spot Anyway, just having warmed up for that show and thought about the stuff and 
uh, listen to some of the music and whatnot. I was already in that mood, so it led to me picking up these two things, and which was great because when I was done filming the episode and I was all geared up and in the mood to listen to 10cc and Super Tramp and um, you know ELO and XTC, and uh, I know we talked about one other band in there because um, we talked about five of them. I had something new by Supertramp to throw on for me, and that was pretty cool. Now, one of the ones that I found that I wasn't expecting, didn't know anything about, but I pulled this off of the shelf, Robert Teppard. And when I say shelf, I mean I was looking through the used stuff, and, and I saw on the side of this, uh, you know, uh, Robert Teppard, no easy way out on Scotty Brothers Records. And Scotty Brothers Records is one of those labels that I have found I pretty much like anything that's on it if it came out of the 80s. They seem to be in that sort of rock pop vein. You know, Scotty Records had Survivor on it. Um, trying to remember who else was on Scotty Brothers um, besides Weird Al Yankovic. He was on there. Um, but there was a couple artists that I really, really enjoyed their music who were on that label. And the more I've dug around when I find Scotty Brothers records, maybe it was the, the Rocky soundtracks and things like that, but it was just, oh, this is good stuff. So I pulled this out and I flipped it over and I just said, you know, between that picture and that picture, this guy looks like he's ripped right out of the 80s. It's 1986. It's on Scotty Brothers. I better look it up. And I did. And I didn't know this, but the song No Easy Way Out was from, I think, the Rocky IV soundtrack. So I knew it from that, from the movie. But I didn't know it by the name or the artist. And when I heard that, I said, oh my God, this is such good stuff. And the rest of the album is that way. So I made a killer score that I wasn't expecting to. Wouldn't normally have known who this guy was or maybe necessarily given at the time of day. But you guys have heard me talk about it recently where... Um, actually, in last week's episode, I talked about the band Voices that I found at High Fidelity Records, and it just screamed and looked like something I would like out of these. It was 1989, MCA Records. I looked at the guys, and they looked like rock and rollers. And that turned out to be fantastic. Several of you guys have asked me how that turned out to be. And that band sounds like maybe um, The Cult with a little bit of goth influences to them. But definitely on the rock side of the cult. But uh, like I said, a little bit more goth maybe to them. Really good stuff. I'm totally glad I picked it up. And I got to say, same thing here. You know, back in the day, we didn't have internet. We didn't have, you know, stuff to go check out on these bands. So you had to go on the album covers. And I kind of pride myself. I, I think I have a good, I don't know, radar, whatever you want to call it, for determining Buy an album cover, whether something's going to be good or not. Case in point, this album here, I saw that and I said, it's got to be good. Look how killer that album is. Knew nothing about this. I mean, this could have turned out to be anything, I suppose. But I said, it's going to be rock. It's going to sound like the 1980s. Look at the album cover. You don't do that if you're a rap artist, if you're an R&B artist, if you're a pop artist today. Uh, no. So I, I knew that had to be good. This one here, while not necessarily the greatest album cover, did catch my eye. But what caught my eye was the Frontiers Records label. So sort of like Scotty Brothers, I know that Frontiers Records, pretty much anything they do, I like. It's going to be in the rock vein. I don't have to worry that it's going to be some R&B group or something different that I don't like. Uh, and this is why I always provide you guys with that extra information on the record labels, who's in the bands, the time frame, all that kind of stuff. Because I'm not just giving it to you as like worthless information, but if you pay attention, you might start to find that there's certain record labels you really like, or there's certain time frames of music that are your niche. You know, for me, if it came out between '89 and '91, I'm buying it. I, you know, that that era of rock and roll was for me. All right, so keeping on. Some of that 80s rock stuff. Chicago, their 1989 album. I think this one is 19. Um, hard to find, man. These are out of print. This one, I can't believe Chicago 17 is out of print. 
Um, I had a copy of that, and unfortunately, I got home and opened it up, and the CD inside was not the Chicago 17. It was a Chicago best of or greatest hits. So I'd opened it, and I saw Chicago, and I looked at it, and everything was good, and I went and I bought it. I was very excited to find Chicago 17 on CD. I have an LP copy of it. But I popped it in, and I said, wait, that's not the song this album is supposed to start with. It's supposed to start with Stay the Night. And I pulled it out. I couldn't believe it. I was so bummed. I got to go return it now to Sound Exchange. And they don't have any more copies of it. And since it's out of print, I'm going to have to keep looking. But I did find this one. And this one has turned out to be really good. I've been loving this. I'm getting back into that 80s era of Chicago, which I've always liked. I've never been a big fan of the other eras, especially the 70s and the more straight-up horn-driven, jazz-influenced eras of the band. I like the melodic rock 80s era that had horns as an added element, but was not the dominant thing in the band. And I kind of know that goes against what Chicago is. But hey, man, for a decade, they were this other melodic rock band that's basically like a version of Toto or sort of Journey Light kind of thing. And this was a great album here. Um, I Don't Want to Live Without Your Love was on here. Look Away was on here. That went to number one. And What Kind of Man Would I Be? Those three hits all on this one here. So definitely enjoying that. And then, um, I don't know, I, I dug out some uh, Rod Stewart. I heard the song, an orchestrated version of Young Turks um, streaming. Uh, the end of an album I was playing and then it went into something else and it played me Rod Stewart's Young Turks, an orchestrated version, which was really great. And that just kicked off a whole thing of me really enjoying some Rod Stewart stuff. So when I went to Sound Exchange, they had a ton of used Rod Stewart and I just started filling in the gaps in my collection, which I have a lot of. But again, I don't have the very early era. And that's really just because I wasn't born at that time. I didn't grow up with that stuff. So a lot of you guys, I get some comments, not a lot of you guys, but I mean, I get a few of you people who watch these videos and then how could you not have that or, or you know, you, you listen to this and, and why are you buying that and weird things like that that come from people, but I didn't grow up in the 60s and the 70s, uh, so I don't uh, tend to have that. I have later day eras. I grew up through the 80s, so I've got 80s era Rod Stewart and 80s era Uriah Heep. And until my tastes get into that or until I want something of that era, I don't generally go back into it. I don't buy these bands until I'm having a craving for them and then I go fill in the collection. So anyways, I've been getting into more of the faces and small faces and stuff and uh, enjoying other things that Rod Stewart did and liking that early sort of, uh, you know, Rolling Stones faces style rock and roll. And so I, it just sort of dawned on me and said, man, go back and get some early Rod Stewart. I bet it's going to sound like that. And sure enough, it did. So Rod Stewart, the album, and I'm so glad this is the U.S. edition and not the U.K. edition that has that weird guy running around in a raincoat with a kid. It just looks like an awful album cover to me. And this one here is so much better. Someone told me this, and I, I didn't know this little thing here. Um, if you can see it there at the bottom, there is the word thin. And apparently this album was originally going to be called Thin, but uh, the record label didn't like it, so they called it the Rod Stewart album and yet left the title there, Thin, on it. That was kind of a cool little piece of trivia to learn. Gasoline Alley. Smiler. And here's one that I steered clear of for I don't know, re you know really why, but I didn't like the album cover on it. I didn't like the you know uh, plaid stuff that was behind here, the whole Scottish thing. Uh, um, Smiler, it just seemed weird. For whatever reason, I thought this was like an unauthorized Rod Stewart album for the longest time. I, I don't know where that came from, but I did. And I looked it up and turns out, no, this was an official release. And Sweet Little Rock and Roller is on here. And this is just exactly the kind of Rod Stewart I was looking for. So that one was great to find. And, you know... Uh, you know, I was telling you about how I like Volume 2's of Best Of. So I found a Volume 2 Best Of for Rod Stewart. I'm super excited about this. Same sort of thing. I don't know a single one of the songs that are on this thing. So popping this on is like getting into the deep cuts of stuff. And since I only just bought a bunch of these earlier era albums, I'm now only missing one 
of uh, Rod Stewart's album. So I've got it on my list. Uh, Every picture tells a story. I got to add that one to the collection. I was going to pick it up. It's at Sound Exchange, and so I'll probably have it in next week's uh, episode. But I couldn't remember, and I didn't want to buy it, and I was confusing it with another album uh, that I have, and I just, I was sort of like, "Mm, not entirely sure. I'm not going to take a chance on it, so I didn't pick it up. But after this, I have filled in all of my holes for Rod Stewart and really glad to uh, have done that. And now I'll probably branch out and pick up a few live albums and other things and just continue on. But the way I always go is down studio records first, Then I kind of move into a cross between live and compilations and other things. And I like to flesh out my collection, but I wait until I'm in the mood for something by an artist. And maybe I don't want to pull out one of the albums and I see a compilation I've never had before. So I'll buy that compilation to fill that sort of void and really enjoy it. And oftentimes it gives me a new appreciation for music. And then it makes me go pull out those albums that I have. And of course I can go from there, but that's kind of the reason rationale behind some of this. Like, why do I buy a best of if I own all the albums and, and, you know, and vice versa. So, but there you go. 18 things that I picked up this past week. I hope you enjoyed this episode of new music finds where I kind of, like I said, run through it, give you a little bit of background and information about why I picked something up and hopefully some information about the release itself that might make you interested in it too. Uh, you Maybe you're going to want to run out and pick up some of these things. But um, also let me know what you guys picked up. What is uh, currently your favorite new music find that you found recently? Um, and uh, we'll have a cool conversation about that. So, all right, everyone, take care, have a good one, and I'll see you guys next Wednesday. Bye-bye.